Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Gibbons Mayor Dan Deck. Rooted in family, Gibbons today is a vibrant and growing community located along the picturesque banks of the Sturgeon River Valley. At the junction of Highway 28 and 28A, Gibbons is located just on the outside of the Alberta Heartland Industrial Area and only a 15-minute drive from Northeast Edmonton. Gibbons offers exceptional health care, education, and community and cultural organizations to enhance the quality of life within the community. Now, residents and visitors alike can fish for trout in the stocked fish pond, take a walk along the river valley, share a picnic in the park, or just enjoy the unmatched scenery that Gibbons has to offer. Watch history come alive when you visit the Gibbons Museum or visit just nearby Jurassic Forest and spend some time with the dinosaurs. Come and see why Gibbons is rich in history and rooted in family. So stay tuned as we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Dan Deck. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona of mayor for a little bit, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Dan? I think part and parcel to just uh, how I was brought up. Uh, we were always involved with different things throughout our life. My wife and I had been involved with numerous things. She was a volunteer on the ambulance as a volunteer firefighter. When we moved north to Fort McMurray, while well, firefighting and ambulance weren't a thing, we joined search and rescue. I joined their assessment review board. I don't count um, coaching my kids in like football or anything until I wasn't coaching them and continued coaching as a volunteer activity because when you're doing it for your kids and that, that's you've got a real vested interest there. But when you do it just because you love what you're doing and being involved is a huge thing. And it's a question I ask at municipal elections. Um, if a candidate comes to my door, what do you volunteer to do? If you haven't been a volunteer or been able to put time into the community, how do you have time now? to be a part of the municipal government. Um, truthfully, you, uh, I've sat on the Ag Society. There's numerous other things. Uh, my wife's still involved with our local food bank and I still sit on the Ag Society and it's not a mayor's post, it's just a volunteer because I know what they can do. And I, I think that's a huge thing. Both of my kids are volunteer firefighters. Um, my son lives in the city. He, uh, uh, works for a large company. My daughter is uh, a primary care paramedic in the city of Edmonton. It's just what we do. You you brought up a, an amazing statement, and I just want to just ask you this question a little bit, because during the last uh, municipal election here in Alberta, I sat down with many candidates in this uh, the city of Calgary, where I'm based out of, and I asked them that question. What volunteer work did you do prior to getting involved, prior to putting your name on the ballot? 
And more often than not, I heard from those prospective candidates, well, I don't think volunteerism matters when you're running for council, but you're going in the opposite direction of that statement a little bit. And you're saying volunteerism does matter if you want to uh, seat at the table. Why is that important for you? I absolutely believe volunteerism is a huge thing. Um, we need people involved in their communities. You need to know what's going on. You need to see the good things, the bad things, the social issues that might be happening. And it's a great way to give back. Um, there's a lot of people who volunteer. Maybe they don't have the ability to write a check. But they give their time, and their that time is highly valuable, right? Uh, coming out, taking time out of their day, their life, to go back and do something that is selfless for the community is a huge thing. Prior to getting involved in municipal politics in 2017, when you were elected as mayor, from what I can understand, had you had an interest in municipal politics prior? Because you could have given back in many different ways to the town of Gibbons. But from what I can gather, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and this is the information I've gotten, 2013, you run, you're defeated in an election. 2017, you run, you are elected. And then 2021, you're reelected to mayor. Prior to these elections, had you con had had municipal politics been something you had considered or being a politician be something that you had considered prior to those elections? Actually, I was elected in 2004 in the town of Bonacourt as a councillor. Um, I was serving on the vol volunteer fire service, and there were things that uh, pe people are saying, well, you should run. And I went, you know what? It interests me. Um, it, it, it was just something I wanted to do because I knew I could give back to the community. Um, the time commitment fit in with my work and my family. And in 2008, my work took me to Fort McMurray. So I left council at that time. When we came back to Gibbons, I knew the former mayor, and I'm talking our mayor, uh, Bill Nimmo, who was mayor for uh, 27 years, 30 years on council. And I'm back in town. I'm getting talking to them and talking to people I know while I'm on the egg society, I'm on the community services board just because so, people know you'll come commit and come help. So it's okay, fine. We're back in town. And I'd only been back in town just a short time before uh, that first election. And um, Bill comes to me, he says, I'm retiring. I want you to run. And I'm like, Bill, I was thinking maybe council. I haven't been back that long, right? You know, and I'm, I, was, I was living in Bonacord before. And he says, no, I'd, I'd like you to run. So I went, there's a very good chance I, I won't be elected. Uh, I ran against three incumbent councillors, and I wasn't. Um, I feel I showed well. I uh, came in second. I was, um, it was a lovely gesture. I Took the next three years, just did my family, my job, everything else. And people around town were asking me, you're going to run for mayor. You're going to run. For... Oh, oh, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll make a decision. But it was my kids were still in school, different things. And I went, OK, I, I'll run. And I was fortunate enough, you know what, the people at Gibbon, Gibbons gave me the privilege to serve as their mayor. And then uh, four years later, they gave me the privilege to serve again. And I, I do say it's a privilege because you don't just get it, right? Um, you have to have been doing something right or less wrong than everyone else. <laughs> Couldn't agree more on that statement. Um, now, you have now been in office for about six years as of recording this, from 2017 to 2024 when we're recording this. And I can imagine there's been some very hot topic issues that have been presented in front of council. There's been things that you've been put in front of you that you have to make a decision on. You are the final vote. 
How important is it for yourself to go into those council meetings prepared and understand the issues that are being presented to you by administration, but not be ingrained on a on a matter because you have to hear people out, whether it be fellow councillors, whether it be public hearings, delegations. How important is it for you to be prepared, but not too prepared that you're so ingrained on a decision that you're going to make? Well, I'll, I'll give you a for instance. Our council package will arrive today in our Dropbox. And it, I'll read through my information. A lot of stuff that's done by our administration, let's say going through old bylaws to see if they're up to date, if they make sense. You know what? Those are some very simple decisions. If it's an old, old bylaw that doesn't make sense anymore, you just move on. There's good recommendations. We hire good people, right? You need to take your expert's advice. Um, I don't find that it's very hard to do your research. And the truth of the matter is, let's say it's a major borrowing bill and you, the bylaw comes to you. Well, you don't have to give all three readings in one uh, sitting. If it sounds good, but maybe you got to flesh out some more details, give it the first reading. It can come back for second and third, because to give actual three readings, you need four votes, right? You got to do the first two. You have to have a unanimous vote to go to the third. Then you have to vote on the third. So you always have a sober second thought. And truthfully, um, we're going to vote on bylaws that are going to tick people off um, and make some people really, really happy. And the big thing is you should probably make people think, um, whether, whether they're pro or con, you need to make people think. Because if you aren't doing that, and you're trying to just maintain the status quo, you're usually not doing anything, right? We've had a major development come in in just the last year. Um, south of town, we had bought 4.5 acres of land. It was what well, it was the home site of an old home quarter. And really, it, we needed the approach from the highway. And... Um, we bought the property. The people came to us, offered it to the town. It was within the town limits. Town bought it. We resold that property. We now have a Tim Hortons there. We have an A&W there. We have an Esso there. We have another store or a liquor store going in there. We have a independent grocery store being built this year and um, other um, retail spaces. That's a huge development for a town like Innes. It uh, brings in, it'll bring in probably well over $100,000 in tax revenue from now on. And that's literally a 1% tax increase. So that helps everyone in town. Have we had some people upset with it? Absolutely. You've got to be aware when you're buying your properties that who owns it. The town never doesn't own that, and probably that canola field is going to develop over the next few years. Actually, it's going to be our next major expansion. And it it led to a bit of uh, angst and hard feelings for a time, and the town's desperately working through it. But, you know, you've got, pro say, 10 property owners and four who are really upset, but we're looking at 3,350 other people that we have to do our best job for. And I'm, I'm understanding of their issue, but you know what? The most important part of the Municipal Government Act is you must do what's best for your community, not yourself, not your friends, not your neighbors. And if you hold to that value, you aren't doing anything wrong so how do you quantify that in for yourself because you are the one that has to make that decision you and your six other counselors who are around that table 
have to make those decisions on what is the best for the good of the community and not the individual friend or neighbor or yourself. How do you quantify what is going to be good for the community? Well, if you take this development alone uh, between a and and, say, the Tim Hortons, uh, there's been 60 new jobs. There's a tax revenue. There, it perpetuates itself for years and years and years. Uh, it's jobs for kids. It's jobs for adults. Um, they're both places that you can have both kids and adults work. Whereas if it's a convenience store or something, it's got to be an adult because of uh, the sale of tobacco products or anything like that, or a liquor store, which it's uh, got to be an adult. Um, the independent grocer, you're bringing fresh groceries to town, making it uh, easier and more affordable to shop. And that's regardless of prices. You don't have to drive 20 minutes to go to a big box store because you have one. No, on so, the flip uh, side the, of that, the, how, how important is it for yourself to listen to those people who disagree with you on those statements, who don't want that canola field to change into a development area? Is it important for both the flip side to listen to both sides because you're their elected official if they vote it for you or not? Yeah, you, you have to listen to people and you have to try and mitigate it. With the uh, Tim Hortons uh, land and the grocery, we're putting up a sound barrier fence. We're working to keep the lighting down. We're putting in extra trees in and around the area, right? There, there are certain things you have to do because they've also made a major investment. They're, your home's your largest investment you're probably ever going to have. So, yeah. So I want to I want to ask one last question before we turn to Gibbons as a whole now because uh, that's the crux of the interview and I want to talk about Gibbons for a little bit, and I want to ask about the personal private life of a of a mayor in a small town community because you step out of your house you were the mayor 24 seven. I can imagine there's days that you go to the grocery store or you go downtown to go get something and people know who you are and will stop you to potentially ask you questions about what's going on in the community. Have you found that balance of being an elected official and just being Dan from time to time easy to achieve? Absolutely. We're, we're lucky enough, you know, we're a small enough community that, and have been living here. We know a lot of people, right? We have friends in town. We have, and like I said, we know a lot of people go to an event and it's, Hey, Mr. Mayor, or Hey, Dan, depending on who it is. Right. And some people still don't know who I am. Right. I, I live on a main street in town. Um, we go pick up our mail from the post office. I can get questions there. I could get questions coming out of um, town hall or the local pharmacy. But uh, really, it isn't that bad. Um, you're not having people knock on your door every day. And it, that's also something I think people are show great respect for. Right. Um, Anyone in town, if they put in a request, can come before council, right, and uh, become a delegation to the council. So that that's a really good thing. I think the wor uh, worst thing right now is stuff like social media. Um, people can say whatever they want. They can put post whatever they want. And there's no repercussions to it. And I literally don't use it. I don't read our rant and rave page because it doesn't do anything but cause issues, right? And it's usually six to 10 people who are doing it. The vocal and minority. It, yeah. And and it doesn't have a value. It really doesn't. Um, I, I do have a Mayor Dan Deck page. I don't use it often. I usually just post good events that have happened around town if I, if I do it all. And uh, yeah, I have a Twitter page more so for following others. <laughs> um, so, so some of, if I decide to look at it and that's mostly uh, some of our provincial and regional partners and, or our uh, so, uh, professional or associations like Edmonton global, the Alberta industrial heartland association, Social media will not uh, 
win you an election. It will lose you one if you get engaged with the wrong person and start arguing. It's not worth it. You want to talk to me, come talk to Dan. Dan will tell you exactly what I have, and I will give you the truth as best I know it. And that is the reason why I started this show, because I wanted to get off social media and stop that back and forth. And that's just my personal opinion. And that's mine alone. Before I talk about Gibbons, you mentioned something I want to ask, because I've asked a lot of other mayors as well. Is there an apathy within Gibbons around what goes on at the town? Like, do does the average resident, would you say, know what you vote on on a weekly basis, what goes on at town hall, how you're trying to make the community better? Or is it the sort of the analogy, as long as my garbage is picked up and my water turns on, I'm a happy camper, what's going on in City Hall? You know what? There's probably a little of that in every community. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are switched on and engaged. But uh, if the snow removal isn't good, uh, we'll hear about it right away, right? More so than um, even the Southland developments, right? Speaking from experience people... there, Mayor? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Every time we have a major snowfall, people complain. Yet we grade to uh, pavement within a week, usually. Good every, time. <laughs> every street. Um, so thank you. Thank you our, for our public, that. Our, our public works staff do a wonderful job. Um, I want to turn to my second segment now, and I want to preface this question by saying this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not even a uh, policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion and his opinion alone. He has one vote on council. They may match up with what's going on at council, but at the end of the day, this is his opinion and not the opinion of council. Mayor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Gibbons today as of recording this episode? We have some ongoing issues within council itself and that we're trying to work through. Um, we had a councillor resign because of inappropriate behavior. We have another councillor who got benched for... Um, six months uh, due to misappropriation of funds. And we're still working through those issues. That, that That's a tough thing. We've had a by-election. Uh, we elected a new councillor who is a very good person. Um, fortunately, I've known him for over 20 years. Years and years ago, we used to work together in healthcare. So that's my, my old background. And uh, we're working through that. But our biggest thing is right now um our ability to grow our town um everything costs so much uh to service and we do not we do not have the funds and nor could we ever put it on the backs of the taxpayers so we're looking for local uh doing stuff through local improvement which means development pays for development right uh, but you do have to put the pipe in the ground. You got to have the water and sewer uh, to entice and uh, grow the community. And it's finding those funds or at least uh, being able to borrow those funds so that the developers will pr uh, keep going. Because most developers won't just throw out millions and millions and millions of dollars to put in infrastructure. They want some of that infrastructure there in the first place. And uh, some people don't understand that. They look at and see the town looking to borrow a really large sum of money. And, okay, I know municipalities like Edmonton that borrow tens and twenties and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. When we're looking at borrowing 10 to $14 million, that's a huge sum for a small town. But we need to protect the rate pair, and that's why you do it by local improvement. So when development comes in, they pay those dollars back. And that's one of the big things we're going to have to convince the people uh, that we're doing, and we're doing it for all the best reasons. And we need to do it because if you don't grow and diversify, you're not going to survive in this world. Um, it's it's very hard. I look at some of our regional neighbors who just didn't get like even just the uh, project we've talked about a couple times. That was huge for us. And I know 
neighbors who can't get two homes built. We've had a home development come in. We're looking at another one. We've got another developer looking at coming and uh, developing the land they already own. So it's like we have to work towards keeping that going and keeping our the, the feeling in town. We believe we're rooted in family. We are a commuter town, um, a small town outside the greater Edmonton area. We want to have good services. We want to have a quality of life. We want to have affordability. And we want to keep the, everybody says they want to keep the small town atmosphere. We want to keep a good living atmosphere, right? We want it to be a nice place to live. We've got over 300 military families who live in town. So, and because of Edmonton Garrison being so close. So we want to keep attracting those people. They're awesome friends and neighbors. Um, they're volunteers and they also serve our country. So. Okay. So there's a few things I want to unpack there because uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. I want to start by the first thing that you talked about, which was the conflicts that are going or the issues that are going on in council. Well, I'm not going to ask you about the specific details and I would never put someone in that position. I've got to ask this question and, and I, I'm going to try and set, make it sound that I'm not being rude. So please apologize if it sounds rude. The average resident doesn't care who hates who, who disagrees with who, who doesn't get along with who on council. They've elected you to do a job. You're on council to do a job for the greater good of the community. Things like this, when things like what's happened with the two councillors that you spoke about come up, um, they can sort of derail what's going on in the community and what the focus <laughs> of the community is. While you hopefully have had the past put behind you, is Gibbons in a sort of a rock between a rock and a hard place in some sense right now with everything that's gone on in council and how you want to try to move the community forward together? I would say no. You know what? Um, you have seven people serving on council. And so long as you keep the vision of what's right in place and just keep doing your job, uh, there's going to be a lot of noise around you, right? <laughs> there might be people supporting someone, banging the drums, saying the rest of the councils, whatever. You know what? Keep your eye on the prize. Do your job and move forward. Um, does it bother you? Absolutely it does. Because the truth of the matter is, I hate when someone says something bad about my town. I appreciate your candor there. Um, I want to talk about infrastructure now because I think that is the big thing that a lot, not only Gibbons is dealing with, but a lot of other municipalities are dealing with as well. Um, you you so eloquently said you're not Edmonton. You can't take out a debenture of $100 million for a project. You have a smaller sort of pot that you can play in when you look at funding projects on the uh, with uh loans from banks, whether it be through raising property taxes, how do you see growth in Gibbons coming sustainably so it doesn't happen on the backs of the people who are currently there? Because people are struggling right now. And I can imagine you talk to people on a day-to-day -day basis and the cost of prices are going up through the roof right now. And you don't want to put added pressure by increasing property taxes one or even one and a half percent. You know what? We're trying to keep our uh, tax rate down as best we can. Uh, that major development we got was a huge thing. It was a boon to us. Um, the big thing is, like I said, we have to have de development fund the development. Um, e even if we're taking out the loan, so long as it's coming and funding it, it will also fund us fixing our other infrastructure. There's certain infrastructure at a certain point in time, you just have to do, right? And whatever we get and can get from uh, on the na on the national stage, provincial stage, we take advantage of it as much as we can. We are a very, very fortunate community. And it's not through anything this council or any previous council has done. I, I look back, it's the Gibbons family, the Lewis family who homesteaded here. Our location is perfect. 
I say we're, I always say we're 17 minutes from everyone be it Fort Saskatchewan, North Edmonton, uh, maybe a little bit more to St. Albert. We can be around to Shrewd Park in under 25. Um, we are well located. We're on the National Transportation Corridor. We've been designated by um, the Metropolitan Region as a growth area. So we know we're going to have the people, the infrastructure coming to us. We're never going to be a major industrial base. We're going to have supports to industry. And that's what's going to help us develop and grow through time. And that's what will pay for new infrastructure. Um, we're working together with our school board to build two brand new schools, replacing our old ones. It's, it's a really good time in Gibbons, but it's still a really tough time. And I look at it with um, our food bank. We've been handing out up to 20 hampers a week, right? My wife volunteers there, like I said, previous. And that's a lot of hampers going out. And when a family does a hamper and they can't come back for a few weeks, our family resource center, we give out gift cards to make sure no one goes hungry um, at times. It, 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 and it's tough. It's, it's, it's an expense on the community. But you know what it is? It's an investment in people and you can't go wrong investing in people. Sometimes people just need a little hand up. Um, they're, and these are working people. These are families. So we have to uh, strive to help out others. Do you get buy-in from the community when you help out others in your community? Because it seems like, you, and you so eloquently said it at the beginning of this segment, Gibbons is a family community. It is a community that is rooted in family and traditional family. I don't want to say values, but in a traditional va family community sense. When you help others in your community as the municipality, do you get people saying, you know what? I understand why you're doing this, because if I was in that situation, I'd want the exact same help that you're giving to this family. Ab absolutely. You look at our family resource center. Um, what have we been open? We expanded. We took, when we opened our cultural center, we took our old town hall, uh, community hall, turned it into our food bank, our family resource center. We outgrew it within the first year. We're seeing 200 people a month through our family resource center. And we, it's not just Gibbons people. We, people from the county, people from other communities come through and use it. Um, our food bank is the Bonacord Gibbons Food Bank. Um, the two towns have been running it together for years. I know Bonacord brought in well over a thousand pounds of food this year to um, from their food drive. Our firefighters, it's one of the events my wife and I love to take part in because I'm an old fire guy. Um, we, we talked out at 10, 000, over 10,000 pounds for one day in the town of Gibbons. Um, the town of Legal did all the Christmas hampers and stuff because their people access it uh, from us. So I believe there is a total buy-in in helping people. There's always someone who says, no, they should do it and pull themselves up by the bootstraps. You know what? Sometimes everybody needs a hand. They do. And whether it's your family giving you a hand or maybe it's someone around town giving you a hand, we have an angel donor program. So that if people want to donate and say, help out a family or something, say, pay their water bill, their gas bill, because we know what those bills are like. They can come into the town, they can donate it. They can keep uh, it private, but they get a tax receipt because the town's, town is registered and they can specifically say where that goes to. It doesn't go into our general revenues and then we decide who gets it. They can specifically donate it. So um, I, th I think we're, we've got a leg up on that. And uh, I'm mentioning the angel donor program because I hope someone listens to the podcast and maybe uh, comes in and helps somebody out, helps out the food bank, helps out the fire department, whoever. So, well, for those who are listening in the Gibbons area or even the Bonacourt area, the Legal area, these organizations that the mayor has just talked about are 
wonderful, helpful tools, resources for communities who are for members of the community who are at their end. Um, it is not like uh, the mayor said, uh, they need to pull them up by their bootstraps. It's offering a helping hand to people who are in their pretty bad spot right now. So if you're listening to this and you can, please head over to the uh, town of Gibbons uh, city hall or town hall and help a family or a community member out. Thank you, um, Chris. Before I go, before I go to my last segment, because I'm cautious of time, I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things that happened in the community. <laughs> so what are the issues? Oh, no, I think we, <laughs> I, I think we've hit some uh, good topics. Exactly. Um, but I want to, I want to sort of, so. I want to flip the script a little bit and say, what does Gibbons do right? What is the thing that when you go to Alberta municipalities, when you talk to other municipal leaders from across Canada, you, or even Alberta, you say, you know what, you might be doing it okay, Gibbons does it better. What is that thing that you boast about about your community? Um, you know what, I, bo I, I boast about uh, the people who get involved, um, our, fire, our local fire department, um, our volunteers with our Ag Society, you know, yeah, we, we've lost volunteers over the years and some, some people have been volunteering forever. Um, I think the biggest thing is people are friendly. They enjoy their town. They get out, they watch their kids' sports. Um, the arena's full when minor hockey's doing its thing. In general, we really search for the things that keep us a, a community um we're working hard to develop things but we aren't just developing for development's sake to keep the taxes low it's so we can do other stuff um the joint the working in partnership to build two new schools and possibly a recreational facility where the two schools are attached to will be a huge thing for um both the school board and us It'll eliminate costs for the school board. They won't have to clean their parking lot because it'll be attached to a town facility and we'll do that. It's it's all those things, partnering with different entities. Um, we belong to uh, Edmonton Global, which is really a business incubator. They help to draw businesses to the area. People go, well, why, do we, why are we involved in that? And we're the smallest player in Edmonton Global. And we donate our, we send in our per capita. But where do I find $5 million to do that type of research and go out? It's because we contribute. It benefits everyone. So if you get a major plant um, in the industrial heartland because of AIHA or global, it benefits the town of Gibbons because we're going to get people coming here to live. We're going to get a support business. We're not going to get um, the Dow refinery. It's just not happening, right? But we're going to get spinoffs from that. And it's realizing that value in those investments and investing in our people. Um, we got a wonderful uh, high school here that does a ton with the RAP program and are uh, sending kids to universities and everything. The skilled trades is unlimited in this area. And those are good jobs. And those are the jobs I'd like to see the kids taking and staying and living in our community. Because that's another big thing is um, for years, there was the exodus, right? From small communities, got to move to the city, got to get a job in the city. Well, People are also realizing that they're remembering how they lived. They remember the parks. They remember what they did as kids that you can't do in the city anymore. But you still want to access the stuff. I love going to downtown Edmonton to the Windspear and seeing a concert. But I also like coming home and spending time in my town, in my backyard, by, by the fire. Right? We, we have the best of both worlds. We have access to a major metropolitan area that has everything uh, from symphonies to concerts to sports, recreation. But we also have the nice, calm lifestyle that people want to see. Um, 
I love uh, I'm right across my back alley is one of our ba- brand new basketball courts that was built a couple of years ago. I love driving by and seeing 15 kids out playing basketball. We built a NHL size um, ODR. The ODR in this town has always been the most inclusive place in the entire town. The older kids would let the younger kids play. And as the days went on, younger kids, the older kids would take over. And But everybody got to play. Nobody got thugged or pushed around, <laughs> get away. It, my kids loved it. Uh, when they come out, my son's 29, my daughter's 24. If the, if the weather hadn't been melting over Christmas, their thing on Boxing Day was they were going to the ODR to go skating. You know, so that's awesome. Um, I want to turn to my last subject because it's an important one for me because I've made a pledge. If you come on this show, I come to your community to spend my economic dollars. So I will be in Gibbons later on this month visiting your great community. And I got to know what are some of the tourist attractions that people go to Gibbons for or the surrounding area? What are the hidden gems of your community, Mayor? Well, you can get your, uh, you can go just to the north of our cultural center and our ball diamonds. And you can take your picture by uh, mile marker 26 of the Athabasca Trail that led north into uh, Athabasca and the opening of the northern part of Alberta. I did not know that was there. (laughs) There you go. You can come downtown from, from the town office into the middle of town. And unfortunately, it is winter, but the Gibbons Museum's closed. Come and walk through and see the buildings and stuff that are uh, there. Take a look at the Derwin barn. That was from the Derwin family farm. And I, you may have may, met Councillor Dan Derwin from uh, Sturgeon County. That's his family. The Derwins were settlers out here. These are all real buildings, uh, one we've added to, that were local historic sites. And we have them open uh, during Pine pioneer days and uh when we do our winter carnival and different things and they're open through the summer we usually have a summer student running them (laughs) can i ask what jurassic park means to you because i read on your website of something called jurassic park and i didn't want to read too much into it because i wanted to learn about you it's the jurassic forest and it's right by goose hummock golf course uh, technically, they're in the county, but we do co- sort of claim them. <laughs> Anyone I uh, tell, I say, well, come to Gibbons and we'll, you can go to uh, Jurassic Forest. And uh, it is cool. Like the animatronic dinosaurs coming through the woods in the foliage and everything is just neat. And if you go back a couple of years, you can f- even find it where they were helicoptering in the T-Rexes and that because they're full size. Okay, so I'm going to be given go a few times it, this summer. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I'm sure it's on YouTube. Also, if you want to take a walk, walk through our river valley, and if you go north, you actually walk into an urban desert where we've got special cactus and everything else that grow. We try and keep it fenced off so the AT, uh, you don't use ATVs and stuff in there and destroy it. So you go from a wooded area into an actual urban desert. So it's a really neat hiking area. So I'm looking just a few forward. Points. I'm looking forward to visiting. So you can, you come out and give me some advance notice, and we'll go up and maybe we'll grab a snack at one of our new facilities or downtown even, and um, I will take you down to the museum, and then you can explore some more. It's it is a municipal political date there, Your Worship. Uh, before I let you go, I have one last question for you because I'm cautious of time, and I've got to ask the million dollar question. We started by talking about you and your duty to serve. We're ending by talking about the town of Givens. So I've got to ask, in your opinion, what makes the town of Givens such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, well, like I said, the basic building block is the location. We have a great location for our town. We're right on the edge of the industrial heartland. We're close to all major areas. But I think the way it's been developed, and I have to go back and salute the people who developed the town, right? It, it, it's not 
done the work that I, I do and my council does in the next few years is going to impact the town more so in the next 15, 20 years down the road when we're long gone. There was a lot of people before us, and I think those people had some vision, and they worked very hard to make this a great place to live. And I, I, I think that's really it. We're, we're a good place to live. Um, you know, if you've ever been out, to, have you ever been out to our town-wide grad sale? No, but now that I know that you have one, I will be there. <laughs> well, the weekend after the September long weekend is a town-wide grad sale. Um, we've had anywhere between five and 10,000 people come to town. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's big. It's big. We had, I met people because I'm usually the designated onion fryer at the fire hall. That's my volunteer because our guys uh, uh, sell hamburgers and hot dogs uh, for uh, their scholarship fund and uh, for other equipment and that. But we had people from as far away as Cold Lake drove down just for the garage sale. Well, so, now now I know what I'm doing the second the weekend after the long weekend in September. So yeah. I'm I'm going to be there a lot this year. You you made Gibbons a place that Chris Brown wants to come and live. Actually, um, well, and we've got our seniors almost Christmas dinner also in the in late November in and around our uh, uh, Christmas uh, parade and everything. We have a seniors almost Christmas dinner. We bring in a live band. We do a full Christmas dinner. People buy tickets. It's usually sold out every year. And uh, it's 55 plus. And, uh, one, this, we're, we're, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Dan, I want to thank you. This You have just painted a vibrant picture over the last about 45 minutes of Gibbons that I can only imagine is so much more vibrant when you're actually in the downtown, when you're actually in the community. Speaking about something and witnessing it firsthand is probably something that you need to do. And I'm looking forward to coming to visit Gibbons later on this year, or potentially, like I said, later on this month, next month. Um, you bet. I will. I, I thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honest to goodness, great conversation between two people. And I think we need to get back to these conversations. So thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to do this. Oh, not a problem, Chris. It was a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed the questions and there's nothing wrong with asking a question. I, I, I feel it's uh, communication is one of the great things we lack in this world today. We hear a lot of information, but there's not a lot of communication. I agree with that wholly. Thank you so much. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content, covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of the political trenches, local government at work. We're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth, though, and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. 